始めGreetings, Legionaries. I won't waste any of your time, but this is a continuation of MCDP-5. Earlier, we had already done a transmission of MCDP-5 TAC-1. Now this is TAC-2. TAC-2 is planning theory. And the idea, the concept, or the scheme of maneuver is just to effectively do a guided reading, continue all the way through the text, have some remarks, provide some examples, and uh, continue going on that way. However, I think it's important to add an addendum here before we begin that I highly recommend that you buy this book physically. There are a lot of diagrams that I can't share with you over audio that will help you visualize exactly what it is that I'm talking about, what it is that the Marine Corps is telling you, what it is that the Green Weenie is exactly doing at this po uh, point in time. And so if you want to slip it in your butthole, you got to make sure you get this freaking MCDP doctrinal pub and it's super inexpensive you can get it on the internet I'm not gonna hold your hand I'm not gonna explain Barney style but I highly recommend it to the point where I think you're gonna get it okay good to go alright returning to the text so as we open the publication here it starts with of course the title but quotes and these quotes are probably essential it sets the uh, precedent sets the tonality the tempo as far as how you're supposed to be interpreting the the body of the text and so first it starts with a patent quote a good plan violently executed now is better than a perfect plan next week all right check we already understand that i think we've already imbibed that kind of default aggression 70 percent solution for those of you who don't know 70 percent solution is effectively gathering simply enough information to be able to act especially in a an information poor environment that is chaotic because if you're waiting for a perfect solution or a perfect picture of exactly how you're gonna take X Y and Z solution or or move or whatever it may be you're going to end up getting defeated by the enemy and with a bayonet between your gills so Make sure that you're always reaching out and getting after it. And this applies to many things um, with very few exceptions. And those few exceptions, of course, have to do with engineering and so on and so forth. But anyway, continue reading here. And this is a quote from 3rd Mardiv during World War II. So, the senior commander of a force plans the battle in its broader sense and is responsible for the ultimate success or failure. However, once a subordinate unit has been committed to action, he must, for the time being, limit his activities to providing the necessary support and ensuring the coordination of all components. Regardless of how well conceived the senior commander's plan may be, it can be nullified if his frontline platoons are incapable of carrying out the mission assigned. So, as I was talking about in the first transmission when we're in MCDP 5 TAC 1 which is the first chapter first transmission the idea that effectively to be a leader is the ability to delegate so unity of command delegation of authority and effectively on the battlefield it's the willingness the trust the courage to be able to let the individual subordinate leaders take the initiative and develop the battle space according to the instruction, intel, and mission plan, commander's intent that you've already set out. Obviously, things are not going to go well. Battle, you know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? That's Mike Tyson. But that same principle applies to combat, right? And effectively, at a certain point, when you're on the battlefield, it's way too late to be able to affect the battle space in the way that you would say in a training environment which is why by the way in garrison 
or before times of war or conflict that you're taking training seriously. You're never going to be able to presage the time when you're going to be forward deployed, especially as the United States leading fighting force. You're always going to be placed in an expeditionary role where you're forward deployed and effectively you're not given much leadway to be able to give the effective training possible. You have to roll up with what you got. And so effectively what the, the, the quote here is trying to say is that all the excellence that you're trying to imbibe in those platoon leaders, it can only be made or trained into them by good leadership when you're in garrison and you're training, okay? Or when you're out effects in the field and so on and so forth, okay? That's not going to happen when you're, you know, engaging Charlie and your freaking rounds are going down range and, uh, you know, shit's blowing up and your buddy is getting mass casualty events and so on and so forth. That's not the time to be coaching or backseat driving uh, the platoon leaders or your subordinate commanders, so on and so forth. That's just only going to disorganize them and disorient them and keep them basically on the back foot. But anyway, so continuing on the text, and we're going to read here. Having reached the common understanding of the nature of planning, we turn to developing a theory about plans and the planning process that will serve as the basis for an effective approach to military planning. So, first section, the planning process. Our study of theory planning starts with a generic description of the planning process. This is not meant to prescribe sequence for staff action, but rather to describe in general terms what transpires during the planning regardless of the echelon at which the planning occurs, the specific circumstances or procedures used. In other words, this is generally what planning involves. See figure one on page two, tack four. So like I said before, it's essential that you buy this publication so that you're able to visualize these specific figures that are going to help you conceptualize the idea. But anyway, that's beside the point. Back to the text. Planning generally starts with assessing the situation. We gather information and orient ourselves to the conditions. We identify the various elements and dynamics of the situation, centers of gravity, and critical vulnerabilities. We make projections about likely future developments. In short, we identify the problem or problems to be solved. Based on our assessment of the situation, we establish the goals and objectives. We expect to pursue, including the underlying intent. These goals and objectives describe the desired future that we expect to realize. They also establish the standards by which we will judge success. Depending on the circumstances, goals and objectives may be assigned by higher authority, or we may establish our own goals and objectives based on our situational assessment. During this phase, we also resolve conflicts between competing goals, not at all uncommon in a complex undertaking like war, and may have to decide what to do when furthering one goal that requires compromise or even sacrificing another. While commanders play an integral role in all aspects of the planning process, they make their greatest contribution during the establishment of goals and objectives. The formulation of goals and objectives, along with their underlying intent, is central to the conduct of effective planning. Having envisioned the desired future, we can next conceptualize a course of action by which we expect to realize that future. We describe the salient features of the plan and the interactions among them. Next, having developed the plan in a broad outline, we detail the course of action. This phase includes execution, planning, developing practical measures for carrying out the concept. The detailing phase may not always be needed. Sometimes only a broad plan is required. Frequently, detailed plans, planning may be left until later or may be passed to another lower level organization. So, of course, this is side sidebar here is delegation, right? Effectively, if you're, this is what the French did as a mistake. And as an example from history, if you go back into the Battle of France, one of the issues with the grand strategy or grand battle plan concepts of command and control is that the highest generals in Paris, 
we're detailing down to the timetables of advance, the exact locales of their uh, specific units being effectively placed to the hill that they're going to be on at what time, at the barrage, and so on and so forth, as a way of almost grandmaster kind of engineering a Swiss clock of a battlefield. But as we saw, that was ineffective, right? The reason why Rommel was able to throw the enemies the OODA loop through a loop, right? It was basically to get those iterations on the enemy, which is to say, basically destroy his reasoning, so fall outside his, of his original plan, and to be able to execute and plan and think and orient faster than the French forces were, because the French forces, what they had to do is effectively the platoon leader had to call up to his his boss, so the captain, and then of course it goes to regiment, then division, and finally back to you know army and then army headquarters in Paris and then get telegrammed all the way down to say nothing of course of telegram or telegraph lines getting cut off or let's say radio sets not being properly distributed at 100% readiness. And therefore, of course, when you're able to delegate down to your subordinate leaders, they're able to assess the situation and reassess the situation as it develops and more accurately plan on a detailed basis. So that's what the, the, the effectively the text is telling us. It's just effectively trying to imply to you heavily that you delegate that authority and that you unify the command, okay? So reading from the text, an important part of the planning process is evaluating the course of action in which we try to identify likely difficulties or coordination problems as well as the probable consequences of the planned action. We think through the tentative plan to estimate whether it will help us reach the desired future state. Evaluation is not a rote procedure. Each plan should be scrutinized on its own merits. Evaluation may force us to revisit any of the other phases if discrepancies arise. Not only does evaluation appraise the quality of the plan, but it should also uncover potential execution problems, decisions, and contingencies. In addition, evaluation influences the way we look at the problem and so may renew the cycle. In some instances, evaluation may be a distinct phase after a plan is developed, such as when a senior headquarters for formally analyzes a deliberate plan. But more often, evaluation is an embedded activity according or occurring concurrently with the plans being developed. For this reason, Figure 1 shows evaluation both as a distinct phase in sequence and as a broader activity touching all the other phases. Having gone through one or more iterations of the process, we issue a plan in some form of directive or instruction. Anything from a brief warning order to an oral fragmentary order to a written operation plan or order complete with annexes. However, a plan does not emerge fully formed and articulated after one iteration to be executed as is by subordinate echelons. A plan evolves over time, and so we continue to cycle through the process as time permits, refining the plan until the time for execution, at which point the latest version of the plan becomes the basis for action. However, it is important to point out that the continuing to revise a plan as time permits does not necessarily mean adding ever-increasing detail or complexity. In fact, planning continues even after execution has begun. As we continue to revise later phases of action as the situation unfolds, an important aspect of this model of the planning process is that much planning is actually replanning. Figure 1 is a simple schematic to aid understanding of the planning process. The phases roughly follow the sequence. However, it is important to remember that planning is not in reality a simple sequence of steps. It is a complex process of interacting activities. Any one phase in this model may actually involve various planning activities. The phases often occur in parallel rather than in series, and the distinctions between them are rarely clean. Furthermore, 
Any phase in the process may feed back to a previous one. For example, the conceptualization, a course of action, generally follows establishing goals and objectives, but it is difficult to establish feasible and meaningful goals without some idea of how we might accomplish them. Likewise, it is difficult to conceptualize a good course of action without some idea of the details of execution. So as you can see, it's all interrelated. And it's almost like simultaneously related in such that the plan only formulates if these uh, factors are concurrent, okay? So if you understand that, Legionary, that effectively planning is not this uh, uni uh, or two-dimensional thing where there's a beginning, middle, and an end, right? Planning, if you can really conceptualize it in this way, is almost like a tool in the sense that it's, it's like a shovel or like a three-dimensional um, object that you use to sleuth through reality as you experience it and react to the circumstances by which you confront yourself with. It's a, a way to gain yourself meaningful context and to pivot off of. Just as we spoke last time on the first transmission when it came to the first chapter, same context, same concept, okay? Finally, this model is not meant to suggest that a single planner or planning group necessarily performs the entire process from beginning to end. It is likely that different echelons may contribute to the same planning process, with higher echelons establishing objectives and broad concepts and lower echelons detailing the course of action. We should keep in mind that planning is going on in other organizations, above, below, and adjacent. At the same time, that all this planning is interrelated. This complex interaction is one of the reasons that effective planning cannot be reduced to a linear sequence of steps. So as I said, it's not a linear thing. So there's no beginning, middle, or end. There is no reference to one side or of your op board and not the other. All of this is interrelated, interbalanced, and given context by the matrix of factors which are requisite in deducing each of the, you know, subsections, sections, so on and so forth. All right, let's push. Next section, analysis and synthesis. Effective planning requires two vastly different types of mental activity, analysis and synthesis. Analysis generally corresponds to the science of planning. Analysis is the systematic process of studying a subject by successively decomposing the subject into parts and dealing with each of the parts in turn. Analysis can support decision making at the beginning of the planning process by processing information for the decision maker and by studying issues that impact on the decision. It can be used to evaluate potential courses of action by studying feasibility and requirements. It may be used to turn a broad concept of operations into a practicable plan by decomposing the concept into individual tasks. What analysis cannot do is make the creative decisions that are central to the planning process. Okay, so let's push here. The other fundamental type of planning activity is synthesis. Synthesis generally receives less attention than analysis, but it is just as important if not more so. While analysis involves systematically decomposing a whole into parts, synthesis is the creative process of integrating elements into a cohesive whole. It is a function of creativity and judgment. It is not systematic. Synthesis cannot be reduced to a set of procedures. In fact, to try to do so is counterproductive because it restricts the creativity that is essential to the process. The key judgments essential to effective planning, established aims and objectives, formulating the intent behind assigned missions, and devising a course of action simply cannot be made by analysis, no matter how thorough or efficient. Such aspects of planning cannot be grasped by the decomposing the subject into parts. Instead, such judgments can be effectively only through synthesis. Planning requires both the judgment of synthesis and the systematic study of analysis in some combination. The two are complementary. Analysis may precede 
Synthesis, by identifying and structuring the elements that can be combined. Analysis may follow synthesis by scrutinizing and adding details to its product. Nonetheless, analysis cannot replace synthesis, nor is synthesis possible without analysis. The required combination of analysis and synthesis in any particular case depends on the situation, especially the stage in the planning process and the nature of the activity being planned. So as a sidebar here, and maybe as a juxtaposition, which probably will give you greater context as to how Americans, we Americans think planning, we think dynamically and uh, fluidly, especially when it comes to maneuver warfare. And this is something that's absolutely essential to the Marine Corps because as you know, uh, effectively the idea of the Marine Corps is not simply to do or win objectives by shock, but by maneuver and to effectively employ assets and forces in places in which they will have comparative advantage. So obviously when you're, you're effectively trying to match the main effort of your forces at the Schwerpunkt, so the critical vulnerability, so that way you have force overmatch and you're able to defeat the enemy at a critical juncture and disrupt the OODA loop of the command decision cycle of your enemy and effectively go through that process quicker. Again, the cardinal example is Battle of Britain, or excuse me, the Battle of France, 1940. Now, moving forward, the interesting thing about maneuver warfare, especially because of the fact that it somehow survived the innovations which air land battle doctrine innovated and kind of took precedence, especially for NATO in the circumstances when it came, came to prominence in the army and the smart munitions and basically superiority by fires and so on and so forth. And the idea of effectively abandoning maneuver or rather making it secondary to attriting the enemy and ultimately defeating him once he has reached the culminating of uh, culminating point right so basically the end of their tether why am i saying this well the interesting thing about maneuver warfare is that it juxtaposes against how the soviets thought right and the soviets and their forebearers which are now the russians the other signatories of the CSTO, so obviously Belarus, so on and so forth, basically op for of today, they still think in a way that's actually pretty interesting. So their officer corps and their NCO corps is taught a series of analytical approaches to certain circumstances. They're taught specific types of maneuvers. So, you know, namely the maneuvers of, first of all, attacking an objective by shock and taking it. Should it fail, of course, or the opportunity present itself, you do the semi-encirclement or the hybrid encirclement, which is basically attacking from the front and flanking, or of course, the double envelopment. Now, I know this sounds kind of crazy and uh, it sounds kind of intuitive to us because it, it is so sclerotic, it is so, mechanistic and quite in juxtaposition to what the doctrine of planning is, the Russians or the Soviets at the time were effectively banking on the fact that the best way to diminish the fog of war was to ultimately have a flow chart of events for tacticians and commanders to follow by and react to circumstances so that way their higher and adjacent elements who are working in congruence or, or cooperation with the attacking element will be able to preempt or understand what their objectives are simply because they don't need to do the planning. It is already simply input output. And um, this is a product of uh, Marxist Leninist theory and uh, material dialect uh, dialecticism, excuse me, and the salience of this is, of course, the idea, for those of you who are not philosophy nerds and all that kind of stuff, is this idea that basically as you engage with the material world and it provides you with resistance, with trials, tribulations, so on and so forth, 
you slowly start to approximate the reality of life. And what does this mean? It's almost like you're cinching your way closer to having an absolute reading of the material layout of nature, of the world as it is, as opposed to having to constantly guess or fluidly understand the circumstances under which you may not actually have 100% of the solution. The Soviet army focused on having the good enough or maybe approximating the universal tactical or operational stratagems. So that way, for military planners, it doesn't come down to the skill of the commander as such, but rather they're able to make science or rather, how do you say this? It's, it's like, instead of saying it's scientific, it's more about making it mechanistic, making it so that way it's predictable that a certain confrontation will very likely end up in a certain amount of casualties taken and casualties inflicted. And therefore, for the planners that are way up at the Stavka, which is basically the, uh, the, the Soviet Army's high command, they're able to plan all the way in advance how many T-40s, or excuse me, T-80s they need, how many weapon systems they need, what kind of C2 equipment do they need, and so on and so forth. And so they're able to, quote unquote, scientifically adjust to circumstances and reduce all their decisions at the strategic level or operational level to a tool belt of universal parts. And so military thinking ceases to be fluid. It ceases to be engaging the intellect and more about rote memory and application of force by shock, therefore incurring many casualties, of course, as you can see in the Ukrainian war and also in wars in which the United States or NATO has confronted, uh, generally speaking, Soviet pattern, military doctrine, battle doctrine forces, we come up way ahead because ultimately they're not allowed to think outside of the box. They're not allowed to be fluid. They have to be so rigid. And you have to take this with a grain of salt. There is, of course, latitude for especially divisional and brigade and battalion level commanders to make their own fluid decisions, especially when it comes to conducting their own independent operations and their operational tempo. So not everything is cut and dry A, B, and C. And there are some ad advantages, of course, with this Soviet doctrine, this idea that if you give your junior officers a rearing in which they can basically understand every circumstance they're likely to come across and give them a rule of thumb and how to act so that way they're able to act without thinking there is an advantage to that you shorten the the span of your OODA loop which is independent of course of the intellectual quotient or the IQ of the officer who is in charge because again that is another challenge that we face right because Ultimately, there's this human dimension. And if you're always leaning on thinking in the moment, what ends up happening is you get shocked because you're still waiting for all the information to come in so you can synthesize it and plan accordingly. And or, for instance, if you know, you're know you trying a tactic for the first time and you have never used it in a, in a battlefield environment, and if it's completely outside of the, I guess, institutional culture in which you're basically part of, whether it's Marine Corps, the Army, or a wider NATO force with a, a standard culture, what ends up happening is, is you're not able to preempt how the enemy would likely react to your tactic. So a classic way of shaping an uncertain environment is by taking the offensive and the reason why you would do that is effectively forcing the enemy to react to you makes it a lot easier to understand what they're doing in that reaction as opposed to the nebulous or uh, kind of gray mist radar that you have when they have the initiative because ultimately the dynamic individual, the one that is taking the initiative, who is effectively taking 
aggressive maneuvers is the one that's able to leverage surprise and shock to their side, whereas the one who is static or reactive, effectively the one who is on the defensive, has to be constantly vigilant all the time. And this dynamic plays out all the time when it comes to, for instance, the idea of when you're hunting for uh, terrorists, right? Of course, it probably is very frustrating for soft unit guys to do hundreds of raids and for no success, no dice to result from that. But they only have to get lucky once. Whereas the guy who's on the defensive has to be lucky every time. And so when you put your enemy in a circumstance in which they have to be constantly on the vigil or they have to be reacting to how you act, this makes them predictable and therefore defeatable because you're able to calculate where their center of gravity is currently deployed and therefore the corollary where their critical vulnerability will be and develop them from there. Now bringing this full circle and what this has to do with planning is that I think there's a happy medium here. I think, especially in my experience, and I think in the experience of various others, of course there is tactical and operational wisdom that we can lean on from history. And there's this expectation of especially officers to do their own self-taught military scholarship and uh, learning. And this is part of that project, right? In all seriousness though, this is part of that project. However, I think it's a mistake to lean on one side or the other. The reason why Napoleon Bonaparte was such a successful planner is because prior to engaging in operations or battles, he would think through his plan, but most importantly, he would think through all the possibilities in which he would be able to, uh, to deploy his units. He would have a standard universal belt of standard maneuvers he would be able to use for certain circumstances and he would be able to plan for contingencies from there. Once engaged in operations, once engaged in tactical situations which he had to develop, obviously he was able to have a tool belt of standardized tools, but at the same time, he wasn't compelled to use them. In the same way the Soviets were only really allowed unless you reached a significantly high senior field grade equivalent uh, officer level, you weren't really allowed to use too much of your own initiative. You're not allowed to think freely or fluidly. And so what I'm trying to say is that Napoleon had the benefits of both and suffered the detriments of neither. And this is my kind of personal, I guess, conviction. I think that when it comes to American officers and planning and battlefield tactics and so on and so forth, I think we should end up doing very simple things in which we're constantly conditioning leaders to do a set number of maneuvers, but with the expectation that they're able to innovate or go outside the box should the circumstances arise and present itself. So long story short, what I'm trying to tell you is drill down some basic tactical or operational concepts, make them almost reflex, but don't be trapped by them. Don't be like a Soviet, right? Be able to think fluidly as well. So returning to the text, next section, the planning hierarchy. Planning activities occupy a hierarchical continuum that includes conceptual, functional, and detailed planning. And then in parentheses, it says see figure two on page two, tack 10. I'm just going to give you a visualization of what it looks like. It looks like a big rectangle, right? Like a big, uh, almost like a sky rise or something like that. And at the top, it reads conceptual. At the middle, it reads functional. And at the bottom, it reads detailed. And then there's an arrow going up that reads details, influence, concepts. And then arrow running down that says concepts drive details. So obviously the interrelationship between the extremes and the dialectic of the two being the center, right? So continuing with this text, at the highest level is what we call conceptual planning. 
It establishes aims, objectives, and intentions, and involves developing broad concepts for action. In general, conceptual planning is a process of creative synthesis supported by analysis. It generally corresponds to the art of war. Developing tactical, operational, or strategic concepts for the overall conduct of military actions is conceptual planning. At the lowest level is what we would call detailed planning that is concerned with translating the broad concept into complete and practicable plan. Detailed planning generally corresponds to the science of war and encompasses the specifics of implementation. It is generally an analytical process of decomposing the concept into executable tasks, although it likely involves some elements of synthesis as well. Detailed planning works out the scheduling, coordination, or technical issues involving, involved with moving, sustaining, administering, and directing military forces. Unlike conceptual planning, detailed planning does not involve the establishment of objectives. Detailed planning works out actions to accomplish objectives assigned by higher authority. Between the highest and lowest levels of planning is what we would call functional planning. That involves elements of both conceptual and detailed planning in different degrees. Functional planning is concerned with designating supporting plans, or excuse me, designing supporting plans for discrete functional activities like maneuver, fires, logistics, intelligence, and force protection. Due to the importance of conceptual planning, the commander will normally personally direct the formulation of plans at this level. While the commander is also engaged in both functional and detailed planning, the specific aspects of these are often left to the staff. In general, conceptual planning should provide the basis for all subsequent planning. That is to say, it provides the central axiom, right? The context by which, or the big, basically the frame from which people build off of. So I'm reading again. As our model of the planning process shows, planning should generally progress from the general to the specific. For example, the overall intent and concept of operations lead to subordinate intents and concepts of operations as well as to supporting functional concepts. These in turn lead eventually to the specifics of ex execution. However, the dynamic does not operate in only one direction. Conceptual design must be responsive to functional constraints. For example, the realities of deployment schedules can dictate employment schemes, a conceptual concern. Functional design, in turn, must be responsive to more detailed requirements of execution. In this way, the different levels of planning mutually influence one another. So to recap this entire section, right, it's this idea that the bigger conceptually you go, the more generalist it is, the more broad stroke it is, and the more detail-oriented you go, or rather the more tactical you go, the more analytical it becomes, the more uh, hard goalposts and objectives and uh, you know time hacks and so on and so forth, those things start to crystallize. Now, what did the author mean when he said, for instance, um, how is it that detailed planning affects the conceptual design? Well, when he's, what he's trying to say is effectively you can only establish strategy based on the capabilities and limitations of your guys, right? So imagine you're in charge of platoon. You know how your guys act. You know how well-trained they are, how green they may be, how well-rested they may be, how well-disciplined they may be, and so on and so forth, or athletic and so on. And so you always take these factors into account when it comes to their general function and the scheme of maneuver you tend to employ. And, you know, if you have a more high-speed, high-discipline, high-ability team with high capabilities and training, like, let's say, you're, you're on a MARSOC, you know, freaking squad, and you're about to assault and do a raid, you can do things which a, a maybe a line element can't, right? Whether it's by training or simply there's just like a higher level of human capital being 
you know, foisted on on the Raiders. You know, obviously the elite is always there as opposed to the line, which is a very much a, a mix mash, um, which is, you know, each have their purpose, each has their ability. But the, the wider point that I'm trying to make is the idea that effectively your plans cannot simply, you know, have a one size fit all strategy. It, take, for instance, the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese understood during the Vietnam War when they were countering us that they were fighting one of the best militaries, the strongest militaries, the most logistically supplied militaries in the world. And therefore, much of their strategy had to hinge on psychological and guerrilla warfare. Even though, of course, they had conventional capabilities, which they obviously leveraged to a number of, of uh, different operations and, and attacks and so on, and they had Air Force uh, capability as well as, you know, the whole shebang. But they understood that in a, a, a stand-up knockdown knock fight, they would lose, and they often lose, lost. I think they, I think they lost roughly 90% percent plus of all the engagements they they engaged in and roughly 95 percent of all operations they engaged in however they were successful in their strategic aims right now why is that well effectively it's because they always played to the strengths they leveraged asymmetries and they were cognizant of the overmatch the americans had when they were battling them you know, for, for, you know, control of South Vietnam. Obviously, they would likely lose when it comes to fires, when it comes to professional forces, when it comes to logistical supply and a conventional exchange. There's no way that they're going to be able to leverage that kind of conventional firepower in the same way that we will be able to or we were able to. But they were able to do something we weren't even willing to do, which is guerrilla warfare infiltration in a way that was a lot more pernicious and perfidious than we were able to do and so on and so forth. So returning to the book here, let's do the next section, modes of planning. Planning activities also fall into one of three modes which we can think of as occupying a horizontal continuum based on the level of uncertainty. These modes are commitment, contingency, and orientation planning. And it says, see figure three on page two, tac 13. Now I'm going to give you a visual like I did for the one previous, so that way you're not lost in the sauce if you don't have the actual book. But what it looks like is now a rectangle laying down, right? So a skyscraper if it fell on its, on its side, right? And so on the left side reads commitment. In the center, it reads contingency. And on the right, it reads orientation. And on top, there's a double-ended arrow reading uncertainty so as uncertainty rises or continues up so towards orientation you go towards orientation so to the right as uncertainty diminishes and becomes lower you're able to have commitment right so this is towards the left of the rectangle now on the bottom or just below that rectangle is another double ended arrow or double sided arrow and this arrow reads time horizon and on the left side, which is next to commitment, reads shorter range. And on the right side, next to orientation, it reads longer range. So obviously it's going to go into details as what it means. I'm not going to explicate it right now, but as we go along, we'll kind of masticate, we'll understand it, and I'll have some thoughts. So reading from the text again. When we are reasonably confident in our forecasts about the future, we perform commitment planning we commit to a particular plan and we commit resources to that plan some aspects of military actions and some aspects of the future are more predictable than others and for these we can plan in commitment mode this commitment allows us to undertake the physical preparations necessary for action such as staging supplies or tasking organization or excuse me task organizing and deploying forces Commitment planning does not mean that plans are unalterable, but it may mean that changes we wish to make in this mode may not be easy or immediate. We should always remember that there is no such thing as absolute certainty in war, and even during commitment planning, 
we should continue to assess the situation and be prepared to adapt as necessary. Of the three modes, commitment planning allows the highest level of preparation but has the least flexibility. When we are not certain enough about the future to commit ourselves to one plan of action, but we have a reasonably good idea of the possibilities, we perform contingency planning. We plan for several different contingencies to the extent that circumstances permit without committing to any one contingency. Contingency planning is important in allowing us to respond quickly when circumstances or situations requiring action arise. In contingency planning, we normally do not plan in the same detail as in commitment planning, but we lay groundwork for exploiting likely developments. The contingency mode balances level of preparation with flexibility. When the uncertainty level is so high that it's not worthwhile to commit to a plan or even to develop particular contingencies, we perform orientation planning. Here, the object is not to settle on any particular line of action, but instead to focus on assessing the situation and to design a flexible preliminary plan that allows us to respond to a broad variety of circumstances. In orientation planning, we normally do not have specified purposeful objective other than to learn about the situation and identify feasible objectives. We develop plans which shape the action in broad terms in an effort to cultivate the condition, condition excuse me, which may allow more decisive action later. For example, orientation planning may commit only limited forces while maintaining the bulk of the force in reserve. Ready to respond to the situation as it evolves, orientation planning thus consists of designing responsiveness and flexibility into the organization. Of the three modes, orientation planning provides the most flexibility but the least preparation for a specific mission. The planning modes also generally reflect the planning sequence. Finding ourselves in a new situation, we first undertake orientation planning to familiarize ourselves with the environment and make basic provisions. Having become more familiar with the situation, we begin to develop different contingencies and to plan for each as the situation permits. As the time of execution nears, we commit to one course of action and make the necessary preparations. Because the uncertainty is usually related to how far into the future we consider, the planning modes also correlate to planning horizons. For long-term planning, we are more likely to plan on the orientation mode, while for short-term planning, we are more likely to plan in the commitment mode. However, the level of uncertainty is more important than the horizon. For example, if near-term situation is highly uncertain, orientation planning may be our only option. The critical lesson of this discussion is that different situations require different planning modes and that we must be able to recognize the mode appropriate for a given situation. So obviously the whole section is about effectively giving you a paradigm, a paradigm to think on a continuum. And depending on the fog of war and the orientation and intelligence you may have on objectives on the enemy, and on your friendlies, right? So both. And uh, so I guess the best way to explain in which circumstances would be the best way to represent uh, how to prepare effectively would be to go on a one by one basis. So starting with commitment. And this is the type of planning mode where you can be the most efficient with your resources, the most specific with your objectives, and the most lean, so to say, with your force planning and scheme of maneuver. And a great example would be, of course, when it comes to uh, the basically NATO, right? Now, if we re rewind the clock, let's take it back 40 years, and we're in the 1980s, and we are facing in West Germany across the Iron Curtain Soviet forces who are lined right on the border and have clear objectives on their side as well to take from you in the case of a general war. Now, 
this is one of the reasons why we have all this high speed gear. When Reagan came into power, what he the first thing he ended up doing was basically a renovation or rather uh, more further investment in the innovation of troop ability. And the way that they did that is effectively study the battle the, the battlefield and the battle scene and the uh, balance of forces and roughly the strategic level ability of Op 4, which at the time was the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact forces, and effectively what they were able to leverage for any conventional exchange, as well as, of course, uh, the unconventional, which would be, you know, nuclear explosions, chemical weapons being used, so basically WMDs, um, outside of those parameters for conventional exchanges, there was this guy who had the uh, awesome task of developing what was going to be called Airland Battle. So this U.S. Army general, uh, under the name of General Don A. Starry, so he was the guy that was in command of Tradoc in 1977. He understood the general disposition of forces, the general disparity of industrial capacity as well as armored units, the general imbalance of manpower, and so on and so forth, and, and generally, this, generally speaking, the technological imbalance. And so what he decided to do was, okay, I know exactly how many battle systems there are of the enemy on the other side. I know, generally speaking, what geographic location they will be attacking. Because again, like I told you before, the Soviets are almost extremely sclerotic and top-down and, uh, you know, very little room for maneuver or any other kind of thing aside from assault the enemy, take the objective by shock. And so he already understood, generally speaking, how many systems the U.S. Army was able to forward deploy in addition to those of NATO allies um, and the general reserve table for reinforcements and the raising of reserve forces and the general shipment of armaments and munitions from uh, forward deployed American bases. So in short, what he was able to do is get a very crystal clear picture of how a conventional exchange would go down in, in and around the Folda Gap and the European theater. So based on these observations, what he was able to do is, is decide the fact that, okay, since it's the case that we have a deficiency absolute of manpower and it's unlikely that we're able to leverage the same amount of manpower consistently over time as the Soviets are, what we have to do is leverage our asymmetry in technology and get the cutting edge. And so what this meant effectively was the ATGM revolution, of course, the innovation of uh, Javelin missiles that the R&D would go into, Stinger missiles as well, uh, in addition to, of course, tow munitions being outfitted on battle systems, M1A1 Abrams being fielded and replacing M60 battle tank, uh, main battle tank systems as well. In addition to, of course, uh, the continued mechanization and uh, you know systems maintenance and upkeep of troop dispositions in the Fulda Gap of the NATO uh, corridor. What you need to understand is this, is basically he understood how many and what battle ratio his men had to knock out of the enemy to drag them to a standstill and buy them time over a very specific crystallized time. And so he was able to custom fit a whole stratagem, a whole operational scheme of maneuver, a whole outfit of his doctrine to fit the circumstances of the Folda Gap. And this is where we get Kevlar and all that good stuff, all that hot stuff, all the Apache gunships and so on and so forth. But suffice it to say that that is a perfect example of commitment planning in which he understood which sectors his men would be at, under which tactics he would be able to effectively judge success or defeat. He established a very solid and crystalline uh, KD ratio that judged victory or defeat, and so on and so forth. Now, transitioning into contingency planning, a 
very probably mainstay of GWAT is the entity of the QRF. And for those of you who don't know what GWAT is, obviously it's the global war on terror, but you'd be surprised there are young guys out there that apparently don't know it. I know legionaries, we're getting old, we're getting old. But at the same time, there's this thing called a QRF. What is a QRF? A QRF is a quick reaction force, but effectively what it is is an operational or tactical reserve element. This is for any contingency should things go sideways, should reinforcements be necessary, should a blocking force be necessary, or even if it's something as very simple as point defense of the rear staging area or uh, the line of departure, so on and so forth. This is something that you'd often see in Iraq, for instance, where the majority of infantry or leg infantry or mechanized infantry, so on and so forth, that were responsible or tasked with the occupation of certain districts of Iraq, they would be basically tasked out. However, there would be constantly a QRF force at the main command post and main base so that way, if any one element or outpost got overwhelmed at one time or was under attack in such a way that was uh, overwhelming, they could have a QRF respond immediately. So that way, you know, obviously they don't get overwhelmed. The objective is not lost. Their buddies are not killed and so on and so forth. Now, the final orientation planning is probably the mainstay of the Marine Corps, the idea of the MU. So for those of you who are not Marine Corps, the MU is the Marine Expeditionary Unit. And the Marine Expeditionary Unit is a standardized schema of a combined arms tactical element, or excuse me, operational element that is able to operate throughout the world in, a, in an autonomous fashion. So it's a divisional sized element, but it's composed of various different equally balanced branches and it's kind of a Swiss army knife of expeditionary warfare because we don't know in the Marine Corps whether the operation will be something similar to 1986 Beirut or if it's going to be something similar to Somalia which is you know you're going there in force to drive out the enemy or if it's in Yugoslavia so on and so forth the contingencies of world crises is so wide and the possibilities of uh, threats rising from out of nowhere that are completely unpredictable. Therefore, it's necessary to be able to think in an orienting fashion so that way you can rise to the occasion in a proportionate and appropriate way. So next section here, planning perimeters, detail and horizon. Effective planning depends on an appreciation for the appropriate level of detail and appropriate planning horizon. The planner must continuously keep these considerations in mind. There is no established level of detail or planning horizon that can be determined by set rules. These parameters are situation dependent and they require judgment, although in general, the higher echelon of command, the less should be the level of detail and the more distant should be the planning horizon. The planner must continuously deal with the issue of detail or specificity. Some types of activity require greater detail than others. Some types of situations permit greater detail than others. For example, we can and should generally plan in greater detail for a deliberate attack than for a hasty attack. In some respects, the distinction between conceptual and detailed planning is a matter of degree. What constitutes detail at one echelon is broad, excuse me, one second here, is broad concept at a lower echelon. In general, the more uncertain and changeable the situation, the less the detail in which we can plan. As with the level of detail, the appropriate planning horizon, how far into the future we can plan, is a constant concern for every planner. If we plan using unnecessarily close horizons, we are likely to reach a point at which we are unprepared for future action. If we plan using too distant a horizon, we risk developing a plan that turns out to have little relation to actual developments. The critical concern is to identify appropriate planning horizons for each mode of planning. We will often 
find ourselves working with several different planning horizons at once as we simultaneously plan in different modes for several different phases of upcoming evolutions. For example, we may be performing commitment planning for an imminent approach, developing contingencies for later phases and performing broad orientating, excuse me, broad orientation planning for still later phases. In general, the more uncertain the situation, the closer must be our commitment and contingency planning horizons. So let's talk about an example, right? Black Hawk Down, perfect example. And the TDG or the historical example is roughly this, that they were going after a number of bad guys that was in downtown Mogadishu, enemy controlled. In the process of their operation, or even before we get there, before they even head out, they had been planning the operation for weeks. They had been, you know, collecting all the intel that was necessary, the places, names, informants, so on and so forth. They were briefing in detail each chalk of uh, rangers that were being deployed. They were briefing in detail every platoon and squad and fire team leader exactly where there would be in the convoy. So there was a vehicle convoy as well as a Black Hawk and uh, Little Hawk contingent that was landing on the roof of the said building. Now, that planning horizon, though is far in the future, the basically, it, it had we, they had a broad understanding of fixed forces and objectives. They understood very clearly with crystalline solution what it is that they were going to achieve. And so what they were able to do is, as we said before, leverage that commitment planning, which is highly efficient, highly tailored to the job type planning from a distance. But then stuff went hay haywire. So, you know, basically they got caught in an ambush. They got surrounded. Two Black Hawks, I believe, went down, if I remember correctly. Uh, a number of different motorized vehicles were disabled. A number of different individuals were KIA and WIA during the process, of course, of the firefight, which lasted roughly, I think it was like 48 hours or something crazy like that. And that's insane, by the way. If you expect a quick raid and in turn you get this crazy freaking continuous marathon where you had to run back after 20 miles is pretty much an athletic feat, which is why, Legionary, you better be in top physical condition. But continuing on, in that circumstance where you're ambushed and you're reacting to the enemy and you're trying to gain the initiative, you're trying to gain the upper hand, you're exfiltrating, you have a general idea of what you're trying to do, which is get back to base, right, with your HVTs. Your HVTs, of course, is a stand-in for high-value targets, which is the object of the raid. So that was their primary objective, as well as secondary objectives of minimizing casualties and obviously keeping the enemy from getting their hands on any of our technology, especially with the Blackhawks at that time, that they could sell to our competitors. Now, this is an option or a, an example of short time horizon orientation planning, because as they were running through the streets and alleyways, breaking through, you know, doors and apartment buildings and coming out on the other side of you know, some kind of soccer field in a city that was very slum-like, so it was very irregular. There was no kind of uh, understanding of what the cityscape would look like just on the other side of that map. And uh, this is obviously before, you know, GPS or any kind of very uh, positive controlled kind of uh, C2 capability that we have today. And so what the commanders of these, you know, the, the company level and uh, squad level tactics were employing was effectively that orientation, uh, objectivity, which is in general, we're trying to get back to base. And the way that we get back to base is effectively running in that position, bounding and giving each other mutual covering fire while also recovering any downed pilots, so on and so forth, securing crash landing zones and uh, reacting to the enemy. And so generally speaking, it became a hasty attack or a hasty defense as opposed to a premeditated attack with a long time horizon. 
It was a short time horizon, and the incidences were ever shorter and shorter. So I hope this is instructive to you. If you don't know about Black Hawk Down, I'd highly recommend it. There's this movie, and it's a lot easier to see it than read it. Just go ahead and watch it. It's a great way of learning, uh, especially when it comes to the planning process, how things can go wrong, the necessity of a QRF or an operational ready reserve, so that way you're able to extricate your guys if things go wrong. And remember, in war, things always go wrong. Your plan does not survive contact. Next section. Decision and execution planning. Another way to categorize planning is by its relationship to decision making. Planning that occurs before the decision we can call decision planning. Decision planning supports the actual command decision making process by helping to develop an estimate of the situation by generating, evaluating, and modifying possible courses of action. If studies, if it studies the feasibility and supportability of the various courses under consideration. Decision planning is generally conceptual planning. It involves synthesizing various elements of information into a course of action. This process is often supported by some analysis such as developing estimates of feasibility, supportability, and requirements. Planning that requires or occurs after the decision has been made is execution planning. Execution planning translates an approved course of action into an understandable and executable plan through the preparation of plans or orders. Execution planning principally involves functional and detailed planning and analysis, although it can involve some synthesis and conceptual design. Execution planning at one echelon becomes the basis for decision planning at subordinate levels as the subordinate develops a course of action to accomplish the mission assigned from above. Where planning time is limited, there may be a trade-off between decision and execution planning because the time given to one must normally be taken from the other. Is the activity of generating and evaluating additional courses of action worth the time and effort when it may occur at expense of execution planning or other important preparations? If we already have a feasible course of action, are we better served by spending our limited planning time preparing for the practical problems of execution? There are no simple answers to these questions. The appropriate approach depends on the situation. Patton's epigraph at the beginning of the chapter suggests that, the matters, that what matters in the end is aggressive and timely execution rather than perfect design. So obviously what the just to recap really quick i'm not going to make a lot of bones about this but the idea is effectively so the different delineation between decision and execution planning is thus decision planning is figuring out how many ways you can skin a cat execution planning is figuring out as you have decided a course of action so this specific way we're we chose to you know skin this cat this way where from can we go to make this mission a success? I know it seems like splitting hairs, but it's not. One is in preparation, one is in the breach. Does that make sense? All right, legionaries, we get to the next session. Forward and reverse planning. We can further distinguish between forward and reverse planning, and it shows a number of figures, so figure four and five. Forward planning involves starting with present conditions and laying out potential decisions and actions forward in time, identifying the next feasible step, the next that after that, and so on. Forward planning focuses on what is feasible in the relatively near term. In forward planning, the envisioned end state serves as a distant and general aiming point rather than as a specific objective. So think of it like a cone, right? So instead of specifically going for a point, you're going for a cone action, rather a cone ending, right? So if you, as long as you're around that area, you're good to go. And therefore, in an a, a uncertain environment, you're forward planning. So I'm reading again. In forward planning, the envisioned end state serves as a distant and general aiming point rather than as a specific objective. Forward planning answers the question, where can we go to next? Reverse planning involves starting with the envisioned end state and working backward in time toward the present. 
identifying the next to last step and next before that and so on. Reverse planning focuses on the long term goal. It answers the question, where do we eventually want to get? To plan effectively in reverse, we must have a clear and relatively permanent goal in mind or we must be able to define the goal broadly enough that it will provide a valid point of reference regardless of how the situation may develop. Consequently, reverse planning is possible only in relatively predictable situations. For example, we often use reverse planning to allocate available preparation time when there is a fixed deadline. Of the two methods, forward planning is the more natural because it is consistent with the progress of time and the way that we act. Reverse planning is more difficult because it is opposite to the way that we naturally think and act and because goals in war are rarely clear or unchanging over the long term. In practice, planning effectively often means combining the two methods, simultaneously using forward planning to provide an idea of what is feasible in the short term and reverse planning to provide a point of aim over the long term. The envisioned end state provides a point of aim for planning purposes at any moment in time. It's not necessarily a fixed destination. We may have to change our desired goal if, as we move forward in time, the situation changes dramatically. On the other hand, a well-chosen and enduring end state may provide continuity and focus in the midst of turbulent and changing conditions. So, Legionaries, I think the best way to explain this is one thing comes to mind is uh, Sun Tzu's maxim, which is the more opportunities I take, the more they multiply before me. This is an example of forward, forward planning, right? It's basically reacting to opportunities as they arise, achieving them, and ultimately leveraging them for a greater yield in the future, which is non-defined. A great case study to be able to explicate what you know, back planning and forward planning look like in practice is the Vietnam War. For the Vietnam War, our objective in Vietnam was to simply maintain the um, you know the uh, Vietnamese Republican government and, and democracy whatever they want to call it basically the puppet the puppet state of the United States and uh, keep the communists from coming to power or annexing them so on and so forth so for us the way that we were choosing to meet the threat head-on was forward planning so in general we had this grand scope of what it meant to achieve success. And achieving success was simply holding on to that state and keeping it aligned to us. Now, the form of this end state shifted over time. At first, of course, they had more conservative French elements, and then it transitioned over to more secular, and then finally more socialist, junta, and so on and so forth towards the end. But the general scope or the cone of action which allowed us to conceive of success was effectively that so long as the government that was in control of Vietnam controlled Vietnam and was aligned to the United States and was anti-communist that was achieving a strategic success for the North, North Vietnamese government their planning matrix was reverse planning why? Because they could come to a very specific set of victory conditions. The victory conditions laid out by the, you know, I think it's the Democratic People's Republic of Vietnam. I don't know what their official name is, but basically the communists from the north is that South Vietnam was unified with North Vietnam annexed as a property and that NATO slash capitalist forces were expelled from the peninsula. So very specific. There are very specific conditions, and it didn't change. Now, this clarity in goal setting allowed them a very wide range of victory tactics. So they could achieve victory through diplomatic routes. They could achieve victory by liaising or allying with uh, the People's Republic of China or the Soviet Union 
for further reinforcements with the common term and so on and so forth. It allowed them a cone of intermediate actions that they could take and forced Americans to be put on branches and on the defensive. So effectively, the initiative was always in their court. Now, I know this kind of case study is difficult to conceptualize, but it's roughly exactly how the, the, the play out kind of went, how, how the, the conflict of forces roughly judged how it is victory was being set. Because remember, the American forces in Vietnam were judging it in a haphazard way. At first, it was about controlling the key cities. It was about training Vietnamese forces and uh, supporting them with you know, supplies, munitions, training, so on and so forth. But then as we became more involved, we understood that it meant counter guerrilla action or coin counterinsurgency. It meant training, of course, and a continued expansion of mission creep. But it also it started to entail what was called uh, the death count or the death toll with uh, McNamara and the idea that success was indicated by the number of enemy KIA per engagement. And therefore, engagements didn't necessarily matter. What, matter, what mattered was the number of enemy attrited from their ranks and ultimately with the aim of leveraging this forward planning element, rather this more immediate series of uh, clashes towards the ultimate aim of achieving stability and peace in South Vietnam and again with an aligned government and positive control of the region. This is completely different from what the North Vietnamese had because the North Vietnamese had such a very specific uh, tactic or set of plans which would change from season to season or they would be used in orchestration or you know combination so that way they could ultimately dislodge American presence in South Vietnam and ultimately win the war. Actually, the funny thing about the Vietnam War is that most people don't understand it wasn't really that we quit. It was that we're kind of duped and I'm not sure if it were the case that we always knew we were going to be duped if it were the plan of uh, the North Vietnamese to effectively break the truce and just to simply you know march on in after we had withdrawn the majority of our forces from South Vietnam but you never know but it's always a great example and I love Vietnam so I think it's really important that you kind of hear this case study and see it fleshed out Components of a plan. Regardless of other characteristics, every plan usually contains several basic categories of information. Each plan should have a desired outcome, which includes the intent, purpose, for achieving that outcome. The desired outcome often includes a time by which the mission must be accomplished. This element of a plan is essential because it forms the basis for the other components of the plan. Goals and objectives may be general, in which case they are defined by relatively few criteria and offer broad latitude in their manner of accomplishment, or they may be more specific, in which case they are defined by numerous criteria and are more narrowly bounded. We should recognize that there is a critical distinction between general goals, which may be good, and vague ones, which are not. While general goals have relatively few defining criteria, vague goals lack any usable criteria by which we can measure success. In a complex and difficult enterprise like war, few things are as important or as difficult as setting clear and useful goals. This is a skill, uh, excuse me, skill, skill requiring judgment and vision. The reality is that given the nature of war, we will often have to act with unclear goals. Unclear goals are generally better than no goals. And waiting for clear goals before acting can paralyze an organization. So as we keep on saying, achieving that 70% solution or whatever solution you can, action is better than inaction. Every plan includes the actions intended to achieve the desired outcome. Most plans include several actions arranged in both space and time. These actions are usually tasks assigned to subordinate elements. Depending on circumstances, these tasks may be described in greater or lesser detail 
over farther or nearer plan planning horizons. Every plan should also describe the resources to be used in executing those actions. To include the type, amount, and allocation of resources as well as how, when, where those resources are to be provided. Resource planning covers the personnel or units assigned to different tasks and other resources such as supplies or, in non-combat situations, funding. Finally, a plan should include some control process by which we can supervise execution. This control process includes necessary coordination measures as well as some feedback me mechanism to identify shortcomings in the plan and make necessary adjustments. The control process is a design for anticipating the need for change and for making decisions during execution. In other words, the plan itself should contain the means for changing the plan. Some plans are less adjustable than others, but nearly every plan requires some mechanism for making adjustments. This is a component of plans which often does not require or receive adequate consideration. Many plans stop short of identifying the signals, conditions, and feedback mechanisms that will indicate successful or dysfunctional execution. So long story short, so you saw the forward planning and reverse planning. You have planning horizons and so on and so forth. And so therefore, goals may be broad or they may be specific. Being uh, the delineation between what is a useful or unuseful goal, whether it's broad or specific, has to do with setting objectives which can be specified. So, key example. Let's say it's Red Dawn, which is when the Soviets take over the United States, and we are Wolverines or whatever, and the communists have a hostage. And it's one of our guys, and we want him back. The objective is very simple. Get Johnny and rescue him from the prison. Simple. But that's actionable advice. Another a, a, a example of a bad ex, of, of a bad objective, or rather a bad goal, even if it's more specific, would be such as, uh, let's see, free America, or free the prisoners, or free the town. In a circumstance where your country is occupied, it would be very difficult to understand how it is that you would uh, go around achieving that goal. And it's not really a good example per se, but as you can see, the achievement of that goal is relatively vague, right? Because even if you were able to say, I don't know, wrestle control of the town from the Soviet forces that have taken over, it's not a permanent objective accomplishment, or rather, it is not permanent enough to justify a tactical, uh, tactical or operational victory. Because just as soon as you raid and let's say you defeat or destroy the enemy forces who are occupying the town, reinforcements will arrive. So what is the event horizon? How can you judge victory from that? I mean, is it a victory or is it a defeat? Think of, for instance, GWAT. We went into Afghanistan with the idea of getting Osama bin Laden and a number of other different objectives. We succeeded in some, we got Osama bin Laden, but we were also very ambiguous as to what constituted regime change in Afghanistan, for instance. And in our minds, I guess it had mission creep. At first, it just meant installing a democratic government. And as time goes on, we come to understand that, well, it's not simply that it's democratic. It must be, in function at least, something approximating what we understand democratic government to entail as far as the ethics and, and the philosophy and, and so on and so forth. And so we started establishing uh, kind of relations in which we pressured uh, basically far left social values into a very non-receptive environment. Uh, so strategically speaking, it was transitory at best and the change was extremely superficial with very 
few key exceptions that are, arise, and I think it was Malala, for instance, was an, a great example of basically this like very far left um, understanding of victory in Afghanistan. But as you saw, it, it was completely transitory because at the end of the day, American and coalition forces failed to achieve permanence of democratic governance and mores or whatever you want to call it or rules-based order or whatever crap. And they were unable to dislodge the very element which they had gone out to set to war for in the first place. So that's an example of bad goal setting. Now, this is a recurring theme in American military, and basically the Department of Defense is extremely lax when it comes to strategic vision. And it, this atrophy is really bad because it's causing us to have you know, significant setbacks and defeats after defeat, and we don't really know what victory looks like. Maybe, of course, it is their objective just to simply go in and wreck stuff, but and they don't want to tell the true motives of their invasion or the purpose behind any operation or war. But if you look at it maybe objectively, I fail to see how America ever gained anything with very few exceptions, such as the first Desert Storm War. We gained, you know, obviously a tactical, a decisive tactical operational victory, but also we achieved, oper you know, strategically speaking, what we wanted to achieve, which is, of course, the stability of the petrodollar and the uh, checking Saddam's power in the region to make sure that he wasn't cornering the oil market, which at the time was centered in exactly the place that he had taken over, so Kuwait and the northeastern part of Saudi Arabia. But with that exception, we generally don't understand what victory looks like. We can't understand the the successful values or the intermediate goals that are actually capable of being achieved. I think this has a lot to do with the fact that, you know, there's a lot of far left idealism and we believe that simply because we take over a country that somehow it will overnight turn into a, a, a spring of, of democracy and so on and so forth. Uh, what, a, what a conceit. What a lie, you know? But alas. But anyway, I don't want to get down stuck in the, the weeds about something so stupid. So let's uh, move on here and head on to the next section. Simplicity and complexity. Finally, we describe plans by how simple or complicated they are. In large part, simplicity and complexity derive from the numbers of separate actions or parts in a plan. The more actions a plan contain, the more complicated it is. To include the number of different phases, branches, sequels, contingencies, and decisions, in general, the greater the number of parts, the greater amount of coordination required among them. There are even more sources of complexity than the number of parts. Complexity also stems from the interactions among the parts of a plan. For example, integrated plans with their numerous tight couplings tend to be more complicated than modular plans. Plans with high levels of detail and structure, as in numerous control measures, tend to be more complicated than coarser and less structured plans. Centralized plans, which place numerous actions under the direct command of a single authority, tend to be more complicated than decentralized plans, which distribute authority. When it comes to simplicity and complexity, the needs of exec executors and planners may sometimes be in conflict. Given time to plan, planners may naturally tend to develop increasingly complex plans with numerous decision points, branches, or phases because this is a useful way of deepening and structuring their knowledge of a situation. The increasing complexity of a plan often reflects the increasing understanding of planners. However, the needs of e execution are usually better served by simplicity. We generally consider simplicity a virtue in plans, and this is a valid principle. But in practice, the level of complexity of a plan should be consistent with the nature of the situation. A plan that is overly simple and dealing with complex problem is no better than a plan that is unnecessarily complicated. Some plans are unavoidably complicated by nature, such as an air plan, for example, which must account for a high number of sorties and a variety of different functions. 
Other plans can be extremely simple in concept, even though they may involve the actions of large formations. Here, the command disciplines, or excuse me, the commander disciplines and planning process by ensuring that the plan emphasizes simplicity while at the same time conveying the appropriate level of detail. It is correct to say that the plan should be as simple as the situation follows. There is a variety of, uh, of ways to simplify plans, as we will discuss in the next chapter. So, well, even though the book itself provides you with a uh, case study, effectively, and the case study is about Palestine in 1918, so when the British were in control, but for the purposes of this podcast, or rather transmission, right, uh, it, it would be just too much detail and not enough visual context for you to legionary to understand what's happening. And therefore, I think it's important that you take the time yourself to buy it, as I said, and read it yourself and commit it to memory as well, especially if you're a commander. Um, but, you know, I, I think it would just not be in the correct frame to be able to actually convey the information in such a way that would actually make sense to you, okay? So you don't have the context. So let's just go over and s skip over that and head to the conclusion. So here's the conclusion. We've addressed planning from several different aspects. This discussion outlines the range of factors governing the form and planning plans may take. We have described the different modes of planning based on the level of situational uncertainty, from commitment planning to orientation planning. We have looked at the hierarchy of planning from conceptual all the way down to what is uh, execution planning. We have discussed the, uh, the basic parameters which all planning must consider. So basically the proper level of uh, specificity and the proper time horizon. We have discovered and compared the characteristics of deliberate and rapid planning as well as forward and reverse planning and also spoken about complexity and simplicity. Blah, 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 blah. So anyway. I think the most important thing that you should take away from this is the schema, the meta of how planning happens. And even though you're not going to sit there and when you form a plan, you're not going to be, you know, <laughs> citing the doctrinal publication and thinking to yourself in such a way which is legalistic. You need to imbibe this information so that way it comes to you in an almost natural, authentic, and intuitive way. The purpose of repetition, just like drilling, is so that way it's second nature. And it, it, it's more dermal than simply your consciousness. It's your subconscious that you want to be able to program. And so when you're in the field giving orders and you're tired and your men are tired and the people under you are looking for that direction, you're able to actually access the correct formula or rather the most effective formula for you to reach the point of which you're being decisive but at the same time, perspicacious and uh, effective in your planning, uh, planning cycle and your planning mission. Now, I think the most important thing that you take away from this, from this whole chapter, is, let's say, several things. One, keep it simple, stupid, okay? Very simple. Keep it stupid. And the reason why we sh should keep things as simple as possible is because of the fact that as time goes on and you uh, allow yourself to basically be put into a conflict, it's going to be very difficult to keep all the details of an order together. You have to make sure that the, the directives are simple enough that they can be remembered in a time of crisis, extreme emotional distress, and so that way people who are you know fighting the enemy and crushing them are not necessarily having uh, conflicts of uh, action or kind of stepping on each other's toes. Keep it simple and keep it safe. Uh, next principle, of course, is the idea of effectively beyond simplicity is the synthesis and analysis of things. Um, we spoke about how it's important to know basic moves, right? And this is where I kind of disagree a little bit with the doctrine, or at least it doesn't emphasize it. But at the same time, having a certain fluidity of mind, an ability to adapt and overcome situations as they arise is essential. And most importantly, how to plan in such a way that retains the initiative. Initiative is one of those key elements in combat that you're constantly trying to get. You don't want to be reactive. 
You want to have the initiative. And the initiative must always, always, always be necessarily the um, one of the factors of a plan if you can actually leverage it. Even the defense is always meant as a kind of stopgap to provide an asymmetry so that way you're able to beat off a foe and uh, give yourself the leverage to counterattack. So what does that mean? Planning or taking into account initiative in planning means that ultimately you need the ability to not simply defend a, a principle but actively champion it and see it manifest in your planning cycle. Uh, what does that mean? Practically, uh, if you're in charge of a training cycle, that you want to make sure that you're taking into account all the things that could possibly go wrong, right, before the rubber hits the road. But when you're in the middle of a training cycle and you're part of the staff command, you're able to think to yourself, okay, these are the circumstances we're in. These are the tactics that we can use should something go wrong. But things are as they are as things happen. So for instance, um, there are two different mindsets you can use when it's before an action is taken and then after that action is taken. And then finally, of course, is the dichotomy between forward planning and back planning. Back planning is absolutely useful and essential, but it's one of those things that is very fragile and uh, point uh, oriented. And so if that strategic end state is not necessarily achievable anymore, your whole plan falls to smithereens, right? So what does this practically mean? Have you ever heard of that term 5D chess, where somehow someone thought, uh, thought of a chess move five moves in a head somehow and checkmate or whatever? It's BS, okay? You don't want to be thinking that way most of the time, especially if you're in a very uncertain environment, just as conflicts are. You want to be thinking forward planning. So you want to be moving along a stratagem that resembles a cone. You want to take opportunities as they arise and then multiply or have, have the basically victory, that small victory, snowball and use that snowball so that way you have a general left and right parameter or rather uh, limit, you know, lateral limit of what success constitutes. So not being too specific on success, but having it successful, success defined in a way that's meaningful. And so that way you can use it as an orientation, right? So basically a touchdown zone as opposed to, I don't know, like uh, a tiny little sliver or uh, a golf, um, a golf course freaking uh, dot of a hole, right? You want to make sure that you're giving your team as much opportunity to win in a meaningful way. But that'll be it, Legionaries. I'll keep it short and concise. If you have any questions, of course, feel free to reach out and transmission and so on and so forth. But I think it's now time for me and Sergeant Barnes to make our departure here and uh, go on patrol. So thank you so much, and uh, I hope to see you again. This is Technica on Lance Legion, signing off. Oh!